So what do you do when you can't fit all of your tools in one shed? Well, you build another. Here, I'm gonna finally share with you a lean-to shed that I built last year. So keep on watching, and yes, there'll be a free set of plans and the whole video is timestamped. So after building my workshop in our new bungalow's garden, we had a little spot on the right where, as a team, a few of us dug up and removed the topsoil, tempered it down, and laid some weed control on top. Next for the base, I cut two structural pieces of timber down to the same depth of the existing shed and laid them out to get an idea of how wide I needed the other running spars to be. And don't worry about the measurements, I'll leave a free plan below if you wanna make one yourself too. And screw them all together evenly. Now it's only a little shed, so it was packed from underneath to get it level with some treated timber. But you could use some sand and slabs, bricks, or of course, a more expensive route, a concrete foundation. It's completely your choice. Then I removed it to treat it. Again, you could use pressure treated structural timber and only treat the ends once you've cut them. And after that quick job one Saturday afternoon, I then went to my dad's wood yard another day to build the shed itself but this time with my husband as an assistant. First, I started on building the frame for the only one long side that we'll need. And I held two pieces of timber together, also known as CLS, and these have also been ripped in half, and I'd already marked where I needed to cut them down. Now I'm measuring every 15 inches from the start, and these where the upright spar supports will be. And instead of a clamp, my husband's holding them tight while I cut those down to size. And because it's a lean-to, where I wanted rain to drip off, this side needed to be shorter than the end of the workshop that it will be attached to. To work out the height of the upright spars though, we pushed a long upright piece against the two and hooked a tape measure on the end and transferred our height mark on the upright. And that new mark was the height that all of my spars needed to be for that side. Now I'm temporarily toenailing the bottom stud to a square frame underneath but don't let whatever's underneath confuse you, the base underneath belonged to another shed that was in the middle of building. And finally, I'm screwing all of those uprights between the top and bottom piece. For the next shed panel, it was the first sloping narrow frame. Because we've already got a square frame underneath on the table, we'll be nailing the first frame onto that so we don't have to keep checking everything for squareness all the time and it saves space while you continue to build the rest of the panels on top. Again, I've got the top and bottom section together, so I can quickly mark where the spars will go. Then it's taken away, and me and my husband, like teamwork, screw long spars where the pencil lines are. But because we're gonna cut the spars to form a slope, the upright ones here are longer than we need, and that top piece with the marks it's then temporarily lined up and screwed on the upright spars to stop them moving for now. To get the slope, I needed to transfer the height of the shortest side of the shed, then measured and marked our desired height on the opposite side. And to get that continuous slope, I positioned a straight edge in line with those two marks, drew against it and cut with a handsaw. and screwed it on, but with an overhang, which was hand sawed off later. And with us having a sloping frame now, we were then able to remove the temporary timber that kept the spars in place. And because it's got those upright spar measurement marks on it that we did earlier, this then becomes perfect to use as the last frame's bottom piece. And another top piece is temporarily screwed onto the first one as we need to match it. Then goes on the final uprights on top, currently longer, so we could mark from underneath where the top piece is, cut them down and screw between the bottom and the top sloping piece. Now I was able to hand saw the overhang off so it's flush. However, this panel that you see in front of me will have a door. So I positioned a spar eight inches from either side. Time 
going to cut them on the cross cut saw and screw them in. Above the door we also needed a frame piece cut down and screwed in. And another mini spar above it for support. And I unscrewed the top sloping frame to flip it over. You don't want to clad it the wrong way around. And it's getting toenailed at the sides again to make sure it doesn't go out of square. Okay, so we've got the three sides we needed. It's time to build the roof's framework. And exactly the same process, screwing spars evenly between the top and bottom piece. And then another one just before the final end spars and it's this inner one that will be screwed to the shed. The outer one will be able to create an overhang which the roof felt will be nailed to and then a bit more trim. Next it's time to clad with tongue and groove. First I nail gunned smaller sections to either side of that door but that first one starts with an overhang and it'll act like a skirting around the base. And I was always advised to work in threes as I go, making sure each one is in the groove properly, otherwise it might look odd when you put the other side panels on, or it might not look even around doors and windows. But I'd stop just before I got to the top of the door opening, then move on to the opposite side of the door. And once I had symmetry, I could then attach a continuous piece along the top, followed by a small angled piece already cut. But sometimes you've seen me use a flush trim route a bit after it's nailed down, whatever is easiest for you. We then remove the toenailed nails to access the next frame and carry on cladding. I know, I should really wear some knee pads. And at this point, I had the panels dropped off to the bungalow so I could start giving them two coats of preserver. And I almost forgot to say, I also nailed some trims on the end of the panels. And while I was doing that, my dad had screwed the base to the workshop and laid gravel around it and I came along to line it with plywood. Then I started screwing all three side panels on top of the base before I cladded the roof, we tested to see if it fit. Good stuff. For cladding, I trimmed down a sheet of plywood with a circular saw and again, screwed down to the spars. Next was to add the roof felt, which I rolled out and sliced two lengths, leaving an overhang and clout nailed along one edge all the way around. That's the lowest part of the slope. For the corners, I tucked and folded them around and added more clout nails. For the opposite side of the roof, which will be the tallest part, this was also clout nailed, but just on the longest side to allow me to overlap it. And I must have forgot to hit record, so I'll flash back to my method where I mark on the other sheet with a hammer to create an indicator for myself where the overlap falls. That way I could pull it back, make some more marks with a hammer, indicating where the spars are, and this is where my clout nails will go after I've applied the bitumen. I then put the sheet back, pressed down evenly with my feet, and clout nailed it down where those spar references were. Yeah. 
Once complete, I moved on to the staining of the three roof trim pieces and left them to dry before screwing on. Quick tip that I've learnt though is if you're in a rush, just throw some sawdust on it after and it'll dry instantly. Make sure you don't add one to the side that's obviously going to be attached to the building. After screwing it and cutting the last roof trims on and placing it on top of the shed, I screwed it to my workshop shed, again where we could tell where the spars were, and screwed underneath the tops of the frames. And here's a close up, we'd also fitted another piece of felt and trim between the two sheds to create another overlap so rain wouldn't go back that way. But before I talk you through how I built the shed door for this project, I'd like to thank Readly, the magazine online subscription app, for sponsoring this project. Now, a lot of you know that I have so many different hobbies, from woodworking, home renovations, narrowboating, ancestry, doing family research, and keeping fit and healthy in the last year, which the girl in this video has only just started that journey. Oh, and sewing. I have bought so many expensive sewing magazines, but they have inspired me to do things like amazing patchwork quilts that I've been proud of. But the problem is, magazines can be so expensive. So for the price of $7.99 a month, I can get over 5,000 titles instead of just the one. And you can use the same account on up to five different devices, including desktops, and also set different profiles and privacy settings if you want to hide what you're reading. And you might have teenagers that want to keep up with the latest Shout magazine, as I used to as a teenager, or Beano magazines in my earlier years, or should I say comics. And there's other benefits too. It's space saving, it cuts down waste. I can use it anywhere, anytime, at home, the bath, on the narrowboat. I would have totally been the girl reading it on public transport, but luckily I've changed jobs. But if you do miss tearing out physical recipes and things to save for later, you can also screenshot or bookmark certain pages like I do when I want to cook something in the kitchen. And I was very pleased to see lots of keto and low carb recipes which I eat, although I do have to cook differently like this meal for my husband. And one of my favourite things about Readly is I'm able to search certain key phrases looking for my favourite artists and certain interviews so I don't have to flick through hundreds or thousands of magazines or even search for my own name to see if anybody's mentioned me, which has happened and I've not known about it. So yeah, if you are interested in trying a two month free trial, then I'll leave a link below. Right, time to go back to the wood yard and build the door. An easy way to do it is push together the two trims of the door opening and two for the door's trims. Measure the width of your shed's untrimmed door opening and line that measurement with a tape measure on the gathered trims. Then pull it back by the amount of clearance. In this case, that's 15 millimeter clearance. And then you have the width of your door frame. As for the height of the door's framework, I measured the height of the opening and reduced it by about one centimeter. I've noticed sometimes my dad does two. That bit won't require any trim. Plus the cladding at the bottom will overlap again like it does with the rest of the shed. So here's my framework. I pre-drilled and screwed them together to make a rectangle. And started marking and screwing where the cross supports would go. I check for square again. Then the all important Z brace to prevent any sagging. The downward part should be angled towards the hinge side and started nailing the cladding on. It definitely helped with the frame and the cladding pushed against a flat edge on the workbench. As for the trim, I hand sawed a notch out to match the door's cladding overhang, otherwise the door won't close properly, and nailed a piece either side. Then it was time to fit hinges, and of course in line with the cross supports before moving on to a bolt. Thank you. 
I later removed this though because I wanted to stain the whole thing twice when I got it home. I tell you what, I always love doing DIY under this carport when it's raining. Another video on that below as well. I've also got two shed trims here to treat, as well as a top piece that'll be screwed to the cladding above the door. And now it was time for the treated door openings trim to go on. And another piece just behind that called a stop lat, which stops the door from being pushed inwards and putting pressure on the door's overhung cladding. Fingers crossed it fits. <laughs> and I've got a lucky leak in my back pocket from Wales. Hey, it looks good, that. To help, my dad put a prop underneath for me to push up with one foot while I could also screw the hinges on. Well, it would help if I could get to my tools. <laughs> and while in situ, the other bolts bit could go on as well. And the above door trim. To make the bolt and hinges secure, this is where I removed some of the screws and drilled holes and threaded coach bolts through. And I know I had a few comments before how I didn't do this on the work shed. I did do, but this is where I did them all at the same time. And popped a washer on and cut the excess off with a multi-tool. Or you could use an angle grinder or a hacksaw. And finally, came back later to hang gardening tools and have a light installed by an electrician. It's been a very useful space.